Hello, my name is Melissa Conley Tyler. I'm Director of Diplomacy at AsiaLink at the University of Melbourne, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today to this Asia Pacific 4D event. Um, I acknowledge that we are uh, meeting on the lands of uh, traditional custodians of the Wurundjeri and Ngunnawal people, where our speakers are today. I acknowledge their continuous culture and the extraordinary resource that is for Australia in the world. Um, we have a fantastic event today and something I've been looking, to, looking forward to for some time. So uh, the Asia-Pacific uh, Diplomacy, Defence and uh, Development Dialogue is a group of people who are trying to think about how we can better coordinate Australia's um, uh, instruments of national influence uh, abroad. And we've had some fantastic events so far. This is the first public event we've done and we've been absolutely delighted with response. So if you, um, I know you can't see each other, uh, that's one of the downsides of a webinar format, but I want to tell you this is a wonderful audience here today. We have uh, more than 300 people who have registered. Um, so we have uh, people from government, we have Defence, DFAT, PMC, all represented, but as well we have education, transport, uh, state government and parliamentarians. Thank you for joining us. We have a great representation from uh, diplomats. We have a number from the Diplomatic Corps in Canberra. Thank you for joining us. Um, plus, we have diplomats from across the region who are, who are joining us um, online. Uh, we have an excellent group of the development community. So there are dozens of members of ACFID and of IDCC who are doing astonishing work across the region. Thank you. And a great cohort of media um, uh, from, from uh, both in Australia and the region, a uh, number of foreign correspondents who joined us. We have business, which I wasn't certain would come. So we have a number of internationally focused businesses who are joining us today and a great group of academics and think tanks across all the major institutions across Australia and as far away as Chatham House. Thanks for coming despite the time zone. So we are very keen that this be an interactive session. So uh, we have a, a question and answer option. So at any time during the discussions, we would love you to put in any questions that you would like answered and then you can vote those up so that the most popular questions that people are interested in are ones that we can then answer for you. Um, and to show that I really mean the interactive bit, we're going to start with a poll. Very quick poll just to get a sense of the room. If we're looking at the topic of is Australia match fit for a post-COVID world, I'm asking you, round the room, do you see more opportunities or threats for Australia in this post-COVID world? So if you answer that nice and quickly, we'll then be able to share the results in a few seconds. Okay, while that's coming through, let me introduce the panel to you here. Oh, and sorry, I should say, this is an on the record discussion and it is being recorded. So I suppose that's a question for you when you're thinking about the, the question and answer. Um, so let me introduce the panel, just so you know the wonderful group of people we have here. So uh, first of all, we have Alan Gingell, um, from, we're counting him as the diplomacy side. Um, so he's had an extraordinary career, founding director of Lowy, head of the Office of National Assessment, and now Australian Institute of International Affairs National President, where I was lucky enough to work with him for many years. So it's great to see you again, Alan. Great. Um, and we have uh, second, Bridie Rice, who's the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Australian Council for International Development. She's been, she's a co-convener and one of the leading people who have got this Asia Pacific um, 4D initiative going. And we really thank you for all of that work. Thank you, Bridie. Excellent. And lastly, we have Hugh White. So he's had a long, I've got to say that, sorry Hugh, but a long and storied career in defence, think tanks, academia, now at ANU, and wherever he is, he is always leading and contributing to debates on Australia's defence policy. So thank you for joining us here. Okay, so let's see the mood of the room. Please put up the poll results if our helpful tech elves can do that. Wow, this is more positive than I thought. So this is not a deeply depressed audience. We can at least see that a time of change also has a time of opportunity in it. So thank you, everybody. Um, we will have the question and answer function going the whole time. So if you have something you want to share, want to ask at any point, you can put it in there. You don't have to wait till the end. So I'm going to get us rolling and I'll just check, Alan, can you make sure your mic's unmuted so you're ready to talk to us? 
Um, I'm going to ask each of our panels to, to start us off by giving us a quick overview from their perspective of what really has been the effect of COVID-19 on their area. So, you know, where were we before COVID-19? What trends has it amplified, altered, changed? And then, you know, a little bit of what that means for our future. So, Ellen, I'm going to get you to kick us off. What has COVID-19 changed for us? Yeah, well, thank, thanks, Melissa. What I want to make is that there's a long way to go before we reach the uh, post-COVID world. As yes. we've just seen in the United States over the past two weeks, uh, the pandemic can deliver all sorts of unanticipated developments. We don't know when or even whether we will get a vaccine, which is the fundamental building block you need for a post-COVID world. So we need to be modest in our, in our, uh, in our judgments where th about where things are going. So far, uh, if you look globally, the initial response to the uh, pandemic has been a test of capability rather than systems. So some democracies have done uh, very well, some have done quite badly. Uh, same with authoritarian states. Australia's got reason to be, uh, to be pleased with how we've handled the challenges. I'm not just talking about the government here, but also the, uh, uh, the community. Although we do need to be modestly conscious of the advantages of being girt by sea uh, as we are. But, but that's basically good news for the future. Nevertheless, the bad news that I want to, uh, to, uh, to bring is that in a post-COVID world, I think Australia is going to be poorer, weaker and more isolated than we imagined back in January. The um, international order Australia has prospered under since the Second World War, founded on the liberal hopes of the preamble to the United Nations Charter, moderated through multilateral institutions with universal membership, underpinned in the end by American power and its network of alliances, has ended. Uh, some of what we're seeing with COVID-19 is simply accelerating trends that were already there. So geopolitical and geoeconomic tensions between Washington and Be Beijing have been growing for a, for a while. As we saw with Brexit, a state focus on sovereignty and against um, uh, cosmopolitan goals has been taking hold in many countries. Scott Morrison had already complained about Negative, uh, negative globalism before any of this happened. And you can see in the data on trade and uh, foreign direct investment, globalisation is slowing and, uh, and supply chains are uh, already to some extent being repatriated. So COVID-19 has both boosted those trends, but in other areas, uh, the pandemic has upended expectations. We are suddenly faced uh, facing a very long-term reduction in global economic growth, 5.2% uh, uh, over the next 12 months, according to the World Bank yesterday, and huge levels of net public debt in many big development, uh, developed countries. So state power has been vastly strengthened and social changes we're seeing, including patterns of work and growing inequality changes in the political attitudes of young people, these are also likely to be very long lasting. So let me just bluntly list my pessimistic assumptions about Australia. A, we're going to be poorer, no question here. The government, uh, Treasury, the RBA agree. Um, the uh, single biggest uh, uh, shock in economic memory, said Stephen Kennedy to, the, to Parliament yesterday. The, so for Australia, the magic decades of growth, of not having to choose between our principal security partner and our major economic market are over. China is likely to be a source of weaker demand and it wouldn't be surprising if the Australian focus on diversification is replicated on the Chinese side, uh, especially as so many Australian politicians are talking openly about the need to constrain China and uh, uh, and to, uh, and to, uh, to look for other markets. The problem for us is that diversification, although a perfectly sensible objective, objective um, uh, 
uh, is that with diversification, uh, there is no alternative market as complementary to ours as China's. Uh, the, from the you know, uh, point of view of many of the people sort of interested in, uh, in this webinar, the fiscal legacy to the response to the pandemic is going to put real constraints on the budget for years to come and the choices governments make about where to direct resources to social welfare, uh, to business support, to defence uh, and uh, security, to diplomacy and development assistance. These are going to take on a much more urgent force. So the halcyon days of the early century um, for national security budgets are not going to return. Uh, so we're going to be poorer. Secondly, we're going to be weaker. Australia's main ally, the United States, looks reduced as a global leader. There's been no international crisis over the past 50 years where Washington has been cut so conspicuously uh, absent from the global response. Uh, would the, will the ANZUS alliance be as unquestioned at the end of the second, of a second Trump era if there is one? I can't see it myself. So a lot's going to hang, hang on the results of the November presidential election, but a Biden administration, even a Biden administration, will face daunting problems. Australia is going to have less opportunity to influence China. Uh, the Australian government seems to have made the decoupling decision and to be preparing for a relationship um, uh, untempered, uh, by, uh, by sort of uh, ob objectives of uh, deeper engagement. Outside the two large powers, we'll have less room to, inter to operate internationally. The region around us, uh, South Pacific and, uh, and Southeast Asia, is going to uh, face additional problems. And the multilateral institutions most important to us are weaker. Uh, these include, of course, the WTO and the W. HO. Uh, our principal, Australia's principal immediate response seems to have been to take refuge in the familial warmth of the Anglosphere through the Five Eyes uh, Economic Alliance and uh, joint demarches with uh, Britain to China. So it seems to me that Australia's world is retracting rather than opening up. So what do we need to do? Hard set of tasks, fewer resources than we've had in the past, very uncertain uh, uh, outlook. We need clarity in our objectives and we need to marshal all our national powers of influence and persuasion and then focus them on the objectives we have in sight. We've managed to do that pretty well with the uh, coronavirus. I just wish I could be as hopeful about the post-coronavirus world. Uh, thanks for listening. Well, I think that was an antidote to the optimism with which we started. Um, so poorer, weaker and more isolated. Our world's retracting. We're going to have hard tasks, fewer resources and an uncertain future. OK. Bridie, do you have any more optimistic view to share? Thanks, Melissa. And thanks, Alan. Great to be here today. Look. I wanted to really raise three things. Firstly, I do want to talk about the situation we're facing and I want to talk about it in development terms. Um, but secondly, I don't disagree with some of the concerns and the threat environment that Alan has outlined, but I want to focus specifically on what I think is a unique opportunity we also face right now. And thirdly, I want to leave you with a proposition. And my proposition is that COVID is the wake up call that we have needed to reverse the systematic deprioritization of Australia's international development program. And if, if we choose to do this and we do it well, then Australian development is uniquely placed to build the types of enduring relationships that we're gonna need to navigate our way through the world that Alan has sketched for us. So I put it to you that we will be remembered by what we do with our development program in the coming weeks, months and years. So as the crisis hits and alarm bells are going off, we're facing a strategic choice. We can roll over and hit the snooze button or get out of bed and tackle the tasks we have ahead. So I'll turn firstly to the situation in development terms. 
undoubtedly COVID-19 is profoundly challenging our national interests. And, and specifically, I want to talk about stability and prosperity. So on the stability front, Indonesia, Philippines, parts of the Pacific are likely to see large scale unemployment, unequal access to health services, a reliance on militarized responses in fragile settings. COVID pressures amplify the existing grievances in these countries and they're going to start testing traditional safety nets. I think the prospect of failed states is not beyond the realms of imagination and will be costly. The job of a development program is to foster strong, fair, capable states and societies. On the prosperity front, prolonged pandemics are going to undermine hard-won poverty gains and threaten the critical regional economic links we have in Australia. Think movement of skilled workers, think tourists as well. The World Bank is predicting that developing countries are going to shrink this year in economic terms for the first time in six decades. This is a massive reversal of the trends that we've been seeing. The bank forecasts around 100 million people will be tipped into extreme poverty. That's less than $1.90 a day. In the Pacific, growth is projected to decrease sharply. Fiji, down 12%. Vanuatu, down 13.5%. Samoa, 18%. Cooks, anything up to a reduction of 60% in growth. And on the tips of tongues from leaders of developing countries everywhere are matters of health security, economic recovery, inequality, social safety, education, disease preparation, resilience. This is the DNA of a development program. And we will be remembered by how we respond. We've been here before. Think of the, the famous embrace of Howard and Yudiono post-tsunami. Or Morrison and Wododo in February just this year when Wododo said, the people of Indonesia will always remember when Indonesia was struck by a tsunami in 2004. Australia was there. Howard increased the development budget, as did the Rudd Gillard government. But right now, despite this development seems out of favour, we've fought more viruses than hot wars over the past few years, but whilst the Department of Defence budget has increased by 291%, ASIS 578% since 9-11, development spending, spending has hit rock bottom. It's at its lowest since Australia began giving aid back in the 1950s. Right now it is at 0.2% of GNI. That's not 2%, that's not 10%, that's 0.2%. To put that in context, by 2017, we weren't just being beaten by the UK at 0.7%, but by the Kiwis, Canada, Italy, and Ireland. And aside from the Kiwis, none of those countries were surrounded by developing countries like we are. Of course, budget is just one measure of effective government policy and programming, but it is a good proxy for understanding what we care about in international relations terms. And it's not just development spending that's been on the decline, it's diplomatic spending as well. And Melissa, your research with Alan that was released last year paints a very stark picture of that. So are we match fit for COVID-19? The answer is no, no, not right now. Not after a decade of deprioritizing international development in this country, but we can be. And here is where I want to paint the opportunity. We face a choice. We can play to our strengths or we can vacate the field. The opportunity in front of us, as I see it, is to reset our relationships in the region on terms that matter to our neighbours. And they are development terms. We want and we need secure and stable countries around us. And the development program contributes to this. But I'd argue that we don't want to just be a partner of choice. We also need allies and enduring relationships that set us up for a very different looking future. And frankly, a future that we cannot predict right here and right now. And I think we're uniquely positioned. We are one of only a handful of countries which have handled this pandemic fairly well, right? We have credibility to bring to the region that we did not have in December last year. Very few other countries can come to this space credibly, certainly not the big powers. We are a practical, 
problem solving country and our domestic response to the pandemic shows this. When the chips are down, we figure out practical ways to make things better. And international development is not just an extension of geopolitics by other means. It is the principal instrument through which we tackle practical problems that strengthen stability and prosperity in partner countries. There is no other instrument of foreign policy like it to tackle the everyday practical problems of public health, water and sanitation, economic policy, human security and climate change, challenges that we share with our developing country partners. And just like you don't send an aid worker into an armed combat with an insurgency force, just like you don't send soldiers in with health systems, solve complex policy problems or issues of inequality, right? The development program is a positive, practical and constructive frontier for Australia's engagement in the region at this time. And I would argue even more so now than it was pre-COVID. So the economics is simple. Invest the time and the resources now to capitalise on our comparative advantage as a practical development partner or potentially have to pay more later. The development dollar delivers bang for buck and at 0.2%, a small increase doesn't exactly amount to sheep stations in international relations. Mm. Yeah. But what it would do is buy us the chance of a different set of human security outcomes for our region and a deeper set of relationships for Australia and those relationships that we might just need. So uh, what's the way forward? I've said COVID-19 is the wake up call. We need to reinvest in development alongside diplomacy and defence. But what does that look like? Look, briefly, we might be able to discuss this a little bit more later, but briefly, first, we do need to fix the narrative and build really authentic partnerships. Visions of aid that fall into charity or neo-colonialism don't fly in the region and haven't done so for quite some time. And most development actors left those visions behind quite a while ago. We need to keep at that. We need to reimagine our development partnerships. Um, the geostrategic contestation in our region can't be overestimated, but narratives that only advertise competition with China don't help either. So our development program must have a laser focus on solving development programs that our partners invite us to solve. And I think that that problem solving of shared challenges is a much more useful frame for us. Second, we do need to, um, we're coming up to 10 years of, of uh, a declining in budget and it's left our development programs stretched and geographically narrow. Now with COVID, it has pivoted about as much as it can. So with no new resourcing, I don't think there is a prospect of realising the opportunity that I've painted. Third, we do need to keep an eye on our policy settings. We do have new international development policy um, launched a week or two ago now, um, but I think there will be a lot to watch and the proof will be in the putting on implementation um, and the world is changing. So we're gonna to have to keep our policy settings up to date. And fourthly, we need to overcome the silos that we have in international relations right now. That's why we're all here. Um, I can see political advisors, bureaucratic leaders. I can see documentary makers here. I can see military <laughs> photographers and others. You're all on the line right now. And that's because today's challenges don't get solved by siloed policy makers, practitioners, or thinkers alone. Disease, COVID, inequality that leads to instability. They all have various dimensions and we need problem solving by generating new ways of thinking, seeing, and I would say imagining as well. So is the development- Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. one, final, one final point, and just to clarify, is the development program a silver bullet for geopolitical contestation or security and economic woes? No, no. But development does matter and it matters now more than ever. Development matters to the future of Australia, the region, and the people with whom we want relationships. But the question on my mind is why doesn't it matter more to us? Thank you. And thank you, Bridie, for, you know, finding that opportunity 
in a time where you know development outcomes are going backwards in the region to see that we can reverse the system systemic um, deprioritization of development reset relationships um, with uh, countries in the region in a way that plays to our strengths so thank you for that very strong statement um, now to let people know you are getting lots of questions up thank you very much if you haven't yet put up a question or reaction please do put it up and if you don't have one please go on and vote up one of the ones that is there already um, so I'm now going to turn to Hugh, and I, I'm, I'm guessing you're going to beat Bridie on optimism about... Uh... Uh, I'm afraid not, Melissa. Great to join you and great to join all the participants in this, in this conversation. Look, let's go back to where we were before the pandemic hit us and remind ourselves that, as Alan's mentioned, we are in the middle, or we were already in the middle, of the biggest transformation in Australia's strategic setting, possibly since Federation. Sounds like a big claim, but we are seeing a, an epic strategic contest between the US and China about the shape of the region and their respective roles in it. And this is going to, the, the way, whatever happens with the, with the pandemic, the way in which that contest plays out is going to fundamentally shape Australia's international setting. And although much as we might like, or many of us might like America to win that contest and to return the region to, to one that was dominated by US power, that's a very unlikely outcome indeed. Much more likely was that we were going to end up with a region that had less US influence, a lot more Chinese influence, big uncertainties about the role the rest of us could play. And our task, even before the pandemic, was to work out how we can help to shape that massive transformation in Asia and what we need to do today and in the years to come to make ourselves able, better able to handle the kind of region that turns out to be. Now, COVID-19 has simply amplified and accelerated all of that. And Australia's own experience shows that. In particular, it has amplified and accelerated the sense of contestation and rivalry between the US and China. It's now almost impossible to imagine whoever wins the election in the US, I might say. The US and China getting back to a relationship which is not overwhelmingly characterised by competition and even by hostility. And that is a terribly serious outcome for the region and a terribly serious outcome for us. It means Australia does now face very big choices. How far do we support the United States in opposing China's ambitions in Asia? And how far do we sacrifice our relationship with China, including our economic relationship with China in order to do so? And it is now clear from both sides that we do indeed face that choice. All of those political leaders from both sides of politics who have been telling us we don't have to choose between America and China, they were wrong. That is a choice we face. And it's not as simple as a choice between security with America and prosperity with China, because as Alan mentioned, it's not quite clear how much prosperity China is going to deliver, and it's very unclear how much security America delivers. Siding with America does not guarantee our security, because there's no guarantee the Americans have got a way to deal with the China challenge. So we're gonna need, we face a very different kind of set of foreign policy tasks over the next few years. And it's very unclear to me that the instruments we have available are, as the title of our webinar suggests, match fit. On the defence side, our defence policy still assumes that Australia's principal strategic role is to support the United States in sustaining the existing order in Asia. And I think that is no longer a valid basis for our defence policy. We are going to need to focus much more on the kinds of capability we'll need in an age in which the United States does not play that role, or perhaps does not play any role at all. And that requires us to think very different ways about the kind of military strategy we need and the kind of force structure we need. In foreign policy, it's obvious that what we need to do is to build much stronger connections with the other countries in Asia, because we are, in a sense, all in this together. We're all facing the question about how we manage our relations with China in an era of less US influence. And so it's correct, as the government keeps on saying, that we need to build those relationships up. But I've yet, seen, yet to see any sign at all that we really understand the diplomatic and foreign policy challenges of building connections with our, with our neighbours in Asia to manage this very different Asian order. And I'm very struck by the way in which uh, most of what the government's done in concrete terms has actually not been to align more closely with neighbours in Asia, but to align more closely with our old English-speaking friends. It's all very Churchillian, if I can put it that way. 
And one of the reasons for that is that we have not been willing to recognise and acknowledge the scale of the problem with our Asian neighbours. No Australian political leader has ever, ever given a speech or written an article like the one that Lee Shen Lung has just published in Foreign Affairs, Singaporean Prime Minister, which sets out the problem, I think, with great clarity and precision. That's the kind of statement Australian political leaders need to be making if we're going to build that kind of diplomacy that we all can see we need. And finally, development. It's a very tricky problem. The world of development aid has always been torn between its altruistic instincts and its hard-nosed policy interest-driven instincts. It's always worth remembering there's nothing wrong with altruism. And it remains, I think, a very important foundation for our policy, for our, for our aid policy. But I must say, it's unclear to me how we're going to use development aid to address the kind of strategic challenges in shaping the new order in Asia that I've been talking about. But one thing I am sure about, a bidding war in the Southwest Pacific against China as to who can build the bigger bridges or the wider roads is not the way to do it. We can't, we can't manage our problem with China in the immediate neighbourhood that way. So yes, I'm afraid, put me down on the pessimistic side of the ledger. We are going to face, we are going to be not just weaker, poorer and more isolated, as Alan said, we're going to be doing all of that in a much more difficult region. And I think we need to work a lot harder on all of our instruments of policy in order to make our way in that region. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Hugh. Um, a lot of questions are coming in, which is fantastic. So I'm just going to briefly ask one more round of questions to our panellists before I move to those. Um, I think, Alan, when you spoke, uh, you said what we need is clarity in objectives um, and marshalling all the instruments of national persuasion in order to deal with the, the, the time that we're in. So I just okay. want to ask people on both those fronts. Okay, in terms of clarity of objectives, does that mean we should revisit key policy frameworks? Um, so that would be, for example, the foreign policy white paper. It would be the new partnerships for recovery, international development policy, and that for Hugh would be looking at the defence strategic review. Um, and then I'm going to move on to just talking about how can we marshal those instruments of national uh, persuasion better? So can we get, what can we do to get greater dialogue and integration between our various Ds, defence, development and diplomacy. So I'll start off with you, Alan. Uh, I think absolutely uh, we do need to, to, uh, to visit those, uh, those sort of foundational um, uh, documents, looking again at the 2017 uh, Foreign Policy White Paper, in which, the, which I admired, but uh, where the, uh, the drafters were trying to look out 10 years um, uh, well, I think, you know, three years um, uh, suggests that, uh, that the world, even the world that they saw then, um, uh, no, no longer applies. So, uh, same with the, uh, uh, same with, uh, with uh, uh, defence and aid. No, I think we do need a fundamental, I think governments do need to look again fundamentally at the shape of, uh, of, uh, of all these um, <clears throat> policies and the instruments they use. Hugh, Hugh made a, um, I, I should say, uh, Melissa, that this is a really unusual historical moment uh, mm -hmm. over the course of Hugh and my long uh, relationship. I've always been the optimist and Hugh has been the pessimist and that's been the, the, the poles around which we've, we've operated. And we've, to find ourselves both on the same side is really, is really uh, uh, unusual um, uh, here, but it's a, it's a measure of how things have, have changed. Hugh was talking about the Lee Sin Lung um, uh, speech. We need that sort of uh, thinking uh, coming, uh, deep thinking coming out of the Australian government, certainly. Okay. And what about on my second question on what are the opportunities for dialogue and integration between the different Ds? And I'm going to put up another poll on that just to get a sense of whether people feel there's enough coordination at the moment. What's your view, Al? Uh, uh... I, uh, I look. I'm. It's uh, the, the easy answer is to say there's not enough coordination, but I've never been fully convinced that that's uh, that that's true. I don't think 
the problem is uh, is coordination. I think it's the framework within which we are thinking of, uh, about all these issues. So I don't I don't think there's an an organisational uh, response which will get us out of uh, this this bind. The response has to come in the ways of thinking that all the people uh, around mm -hmm. the uh, around the various tables in in Canberra adopt. So perhaps dialogue, for example, is what we're looking yeah. at. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, over to you, Bridie. Uh, so first of all, uh, and sorry, I'll put up the poll results first, just so people can see that. Um, so Bridie, from your perspective, what do we need to do about policy frameworks and what do we need to do about greater dialogue and coordination between the three Ds? And the poll results are overwhelming that we could do much better in diplomacy, defence and development policies working together. Thanks, everyone. Great, thanks, Melissa. Um, look, I think I'm I'm with Alan. I do think we need a fundamental rethink um, of how we both make policy, but also conceive of um, Australia and our role in in the world at, at quite a deep um, and and personal level for this country. Um, it, it does strike me that crises like these, be it climate change, disease, humanitarian disasters, um, these impacts. Of, of these crises uh, span borders and they are going to become the new norm. So if this is our new norm, it would follow that re-looking at our policy settings is critical. Um, on the development front, um, prior to a couple of weeks ago, we had a 2014 new aid paradigm that I guess wasn't very new anymore. That um, was then uh, passed by by a 2017 white paper that I think left a little bit of unfinished business uh, for the development sector particularly in terms of how aid and development did fit with broader foreign policy and, um, and strategic interests. With the new, new policy that has come into, into place over the last couple of years, it's headed in the right direction. It does have a clarity of focus on health security, economic recovery, stability. It talks a good game on, on you know, getting beyond aid and, and whole government, but I think we've got a lot to watch there in terms of how it gets implemented. And I think the proof's gonna be in the pudding um, in terms of how decisions are made underneath that broad policy settings level. Um, when it comes to more coordination or greater integration, um, I think that more dialogue is critical, but it is, it's a precursor to doing things differently. Um, we are at a point where each time we bring these people together, there are profound realisations that everybody makes in the room. That can only be a positive thing. Uh, and should uh, continue both at a formal government institutional level, but I wanna see it in the academic community. I wanna see it in the practitioner level. Um, I wanna see us with boards, with, uh, with people from different walks of life sitting on them, um, governing our think tanks, our development organizations and otherwise. So um, I'm with the crowd on this one, definitely uh, we can do better. What that looks like, I don't think we have the answer right now, um, but we've got a pretty big task ahead to, to work it out. Thus, more dialogue and discussion and debate. Thank you. Over to you, Hugh. So on policy frameworks, on better dialogue and integration between our three days. Yes, Melissa, look, I think the, the, the focus here should not be on the documents, though I'm sure we do need new, new documents, should be on the fundamental questions we're asking and the objectives we're setting ourselves. Does, is, is Australia's objective to try and preserve the old order in Asia under US leadership? or to try and build a new order which acknowledges the shift in the distribution of power. That is the fundamental question Australia has to face. That is a fundamental question that Australia has never answered. Now, I strongly view that it should be the second, not because I don't like the old US-led order, because I think it's gone already. It's not coming back. But in, unless and until Australia defines its objectives in those very broad terms, it's going to be impossible for us to marshal our national resources to achieve them. And I agree on the second point, I agree with Alan. Our problem is not, I think, that the that people in, in, in Canberra, in Australia, can't communicate with one another across the policy boundaries, is that they don't have a very clear set of objectives to, 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 to focus on. Once we set clear objectives, it's not that hard to get people to work together. In, in the end, apart from anything else, the cabinet mechanism, when it works, can work quite well to make sure everyone's on the same page. You know, when they're, it, when they're teaching uh, young military officers they tell them that the first principle of war is selection and maintenance of the aim. And I think from Australia's point of view, thinking very broadly about what kind of region we want to live in, 
and what kind of region we can practically expect to live in and how, what we can do to bring that about. That is the key task we face. The other stuff follows if you get the setting and the objective correct. Great, thank you, Hugh. Now, I'm delighted we still do have more than 10 minutes to go through some of the questions. Um, and I always find this interesting because it's not necessarily the questions we thought we were going to be answering, but some that are quite interesting. So I'm going to ask uh, one of our panellists in each case to respond to the questions. The one that you in the audience have voted top question, I'll just read out now, that uh, from Nick Taylor that Australia's immigration policy over the last few decades has increasingly replied, uh, relied upon skilled and temporary migratory flows in order to meet optimal labour productivity targets and addressing skill shortages in our economy with adequate flexibility. What might Australia's immigration policy look like in the post-COVID-19 world? So can I ask who'd like to have a shot at immigration policy as part of our national instruments? <laughs> Come on, one of you is brave enough to have a go at that. Well, I'll have a go. Okay, thank you. Because uh, I think, I think, I mean, I think it's a really important question because one of the things that seems to be up for grabs at the moment is the way we define our immigration future. So a couple of points. The first is I very strongly believe that we must have a, a large immigration program. There should be no retreat from the idea that we need bigger population on the continent. If only for economic reasons, let alone the strategic questions that, under, that, that, that also go alongside it. And secondly, that it must remain non-discriminatory as to country of origin. And that does seem to me to be an a very important point to keep stressing. As we become less and less comfortable with China, let's be blunt, yeah. we need to be very careful that we don't, that doesn't start sliding into our immigration program. Over a million Australians of Chinese origin are a massive asset for Australia in managing our future in an Asia in which China plays a much bigger role. And the idea that we can somehow get around that, something that I think we need to be very careful about. We must not let that creep into the conversation. Mm. I, personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with building an immigration program, as long as it's non-discriminatory, around what you might call primarily economic um, imperatives, that is the people who make the biggest contribution to our economy. Um, because I, I do think that is that is fundamental. So, I, I, but, I, but I, I think maintaining a big skills-based non-discriminatory immigration policy is a really important part of getting the next few decades right. Thanks, Hugh. Okay, the next question is from Matthew Murray. Um, he is responding to Hugh's um, discussion on the need to build stronger relations between Asian neighbours, which are also navigating relationships with China. Um, is the DFAT's shifting focus on the Pacific misaligned with our need to keep broader Asian relationships as a priority for our foreign policy tools? Who'd like to answer that? Probably, probably, Bride, I've got views, but prob probably Bride is the best to uh, begin anyway. Thanks, Alan. Um, just on, on the greater um, uh, immigration policy, I think just another point would be that there is potential there um, around greater Pacific mobility actually having the opportunity to accelerate an Australian economic recovery. So I think that it's, it's an example where we probably need to think about immigration policy um, as, as a land of opportunity as well. Um, has uh, the DFAT focus on Pacific um, undermined our interests more broadly? Yeah, I think uh, I'm in the Hugh camp on this one. Um, the new development policy does signal a very narrow focus at least in development on Indo-Pacific and that is Indo-Pacific really just Indonesia, uh, East Timor and the Pacific. Um, I think it's, it's short-sighted. Um, our future relationships that need generating are not just in the Pacific, um, they're also in Asia. Pre-COVID we saw the nature of poverty changing significantly. We, we uh, forecast significant issues emerging um, in places like Bangladesh, Myanmar, um, uh, parts of Southeast Asia. I think it is absolutely critical um, that uh, writ large, our international relations needs to be thought about in Asia Pacific terms. That is the name of this dialogue quite deliberately, um, uh, or at least in a broader Indo-Pacific frame. Um, and I think that the, it would follow that the development program needs to do that as well. One unique aspect of the development program though, is that 
uh, where humanitarian crises do hit, it has a mandate to operate anywhere in the world. And that has been retained um, by DFAT to date. So I think that that, that is uh, one glimmer of hope there, but no, definitely on the side of, um, we need to think big about our role in the region and not just focus on the Pacific. Thank you. Okay, the now top voted question is from Helen Scott. Um, she's asking us about the impact of young people and the way that they might influence the attitudes on Australia's place in the world. Um, looking at the global connection we have around racism, young people who see that this is the opportunity for structural change. How much do you think young people's views might challenge the nationalism and inward focus that we've been seeing for Australia? Okay, let me, let me uh, uh, take that. I, I, think, uh, I think hugely. I think this is a really important um, uh, social uh, moment and it is one of the things that uh, COVID-19 has done. It's, uh, it's certainly uh, uh, jolted uh, um, uh, uh, young people into a world that they have not, um, literally not experienced uh, um, before, a sort of... Uh, um, you know, a, a world of uh, a world of lockdowns and a, uh, and a world where the economic trajectory is not uh, ever uh, um, upwards. Uh, it's 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 also uh, 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 delivering um, uh, problems, uh, fiscal uh, problems, which young people themselves are going to have to carry the uh, the weight of uh, over their over their lifetimes. So I'm, uh, I think this is um, uh, one of those sort of, you know, periods, maybe like the, uh, the, the 1960s, where you do see a, uh, a, a sort of a revolutionary is probably not too strong a, a word, uh, shift in the, in, in the approach of young people and, and a divide between uh, between uh, young young people and uh, and others, uh, I certainly hope I'm right in that. Thank you. Okay, I think in terms of time, oh, I can probably hopefully get a couple more. So we have a question from Alan Ryan. Good to see you, Alan. A uh, question for Hugh White on the role of our political values in foreign policy. Um, so not just about altruism and pragmatism, but to see our own agency as a strategic actor. Do you want to respond to that one, Hugh? Yes, Melissa, was it our political values, did you say? Mm -hmm. Yes. Look, this is a very big and difficult subject because it's, very, it's, 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 it's tempting and understandable and proper to say that our foreign policy should express our values. But unfortunately, we live in a tough world in which our values compete with one another. There's no, foreign, there's no magic foreign policy in which, which serves all our values at once. So our, many of our values would be optimised, would be served by, for example, resisting China's desire to play a more influential role in Asia, absolutely. Because China's values are in many ways very different from ours. On the, on the other hand, doing that would guarantee an adversarial relationship with China and would significantly increase the risk of conflict with China. For us to support the United States in the kind of approach to China that the United States seems to be taking at the moment significantly increases the likelihood of a US-China war, which could easily become a nuclear war. So our values are aligned on that side as well. Peace is a value too. So the question for us is not do we, what role the values play, but how do we weigh the different imperatives that, that the different values impose on us? Do we seek justice for the Uyghur people? Do we seek the preservation of the special status of Hong Kong? Do we seek the independence, inverted commas, the special status of Taiwan? Sure we do. do, we, do are we willing to run a growing risk of a conflict with China, which could easily become a nuclear conflict, which could easily be the worst conflict in history? And this is not a possibility we, we can afford to ignore. That's a very real danger. Well, I think that weighs too. Now, I'd like to be able to give a quick answer as to how that balance is struck. I don't have one. I think it's one of the great challenges of our time. And just to pick up on a point that Alan made earlier, I think this is one of the points <laughs> where, where age really matters. Uh, as Alan said, like the 1960s, a whole lot of new thinking bubbled up in the 1960s. 
Um, but some of that new thinking has got pretty stale in the intervening decades. Um, and I, I do think we're, uh, that we come to a lot of these problems with judgments about America's place in the world, about the kind of country that China is, about the kind of way that Asia works, which has got a very sort of 90, 1990s feel to it. And so I think we, when we ask ourselves, how do we balance these different competing values, we, we do need a bit of fresh thinking. And I think that's more likely to come from younger generations than from older ones. Right. Thank you. And what will be our last question is from Chris Roche at La Trobe. Uh, so for Bridie, is resetting Australia's relationship with its own Indigenous population key to forming new international relationships? Thanks, Chris. And this is a, a critical area that I think actually some of Australia's best young scholars um, are working on right now. Those that are looking at foreign policy um, are looking also at Australia's national identity. And I guess what they're seeing and what I think a lot of young people are seeing is that there is an absolute collapse of what we previously conceived of as an international issue versus a domestic one. So think coherency policy on climate change. Do we have credibility to engage internationally on climate change when we haven't got our own house in order? Do we have credibility to engage on values of peace or reconciliation or anti-racism when we have not dealt with our Indigenous history comprehensively? Um, so I think those that are far more learned than me on this front would say absolutely not. And that's what I referenced before. I think we have a soul searching mission on our hands. And I think um, as somebody who's awkwardly occupying that space between not quite young enough to call myself youth, but not quite old enough uh, to be a founding father of Australian foreign policy, um, I think that uh, I can offer in that our young people are worried about this right now and they're not seeing foreign policy and domestic policy as some major divide anymore. Yeah. So, um, we don't have a choice, uh, but it's not just Indigenous policy, it's things like climate change and it's having a good hard look um, as to whether or not how we think of ourselves is how we are perceived when we move into the region. And I think if we have a look at that, um, we have the opportunity to reset our posture um, going forward and that would be a good thing for this country. If we don't do it now, yeah. right. We could. Yeah, look, and I, I think the same way you're saying that that, you know, are there that hard division between international and domestic is breaking down. I think this discussion has also shown that that division between defence, diplomacy and development is also breaking down. Um, we've had a wonderful discussion here today, um, exactly what we had hoped it would be. We've had views from fantastic uh, experts from diplomacy, defence and development, and we've had a genuine dialogue, um, particularly focusing on what are those priorities, what are those opportunities for Australia's national interest in this new COVID era. So I'd like to thank, and you can press the little button that shows your hands clapping if you know how to do that or not. Um, I'd like to thank all of our, our panellists for their time today. And I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us, this huge audience for being part of this. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're moving to a closed segment for policymakers. So um, if, that refers to you. You will already know about that because you will have been in conversation with us. So can those people please stay on the line? And I'll say thank you to everybody else who's joined us for this public segment of the Asia Pacific 4D initiative. Thank you very much. <laughs>